it's just amazing that everyone came out. And I know we're all so honored that Max and Jan are here. I just think that there's something really special. It's like they're in our house. It feels really good. Um, I was thinking we could start the conversation. Uh, I wanted to bring up Turing. I mean, it might be kind of old fashioned, but I wanted to bring up Alan Turing's kind of epiphany that not only could machines think, but that we are biological machines. And, and that was, you know, what, what was that? Over 100, about 100 years ago, right? Or not quite, not quite. And, um, and so how seriously do you take that idea that we are just biological machines? Jan, maybe you wanna. Well, we obviously are biological machines. Uh, a lot of us in AI, of course, uh, you know, believe that thought it can be mechanized or at least uh, modeled mathematically and perhaps simulated on a computer or whatever it is that future computers will, will look like. And it's been the case over the, the course of history that uh, every time a new piece of technology was invented, uh, people, scientists, biologists studying, studying the, uh, you know, how humans work, Mm -hmm. uh, assimilated the, the life to whatever process they were aware of. So, you know, the, the body was, you know, f fluid or mechanical, or then was, you know, electrical, and then electromechanical and magnetic, and then, you know, now it's computers, and maybe there's going to be another paradigm later. Mm -hmm. uh, but but we, we always kind of make a parallel between what we th how we think the life is works and, and, it, and current technology. It was a big deal at the time, right, to even, I mean, he's the first one who had the idea of a computer that wasn't a person, right? At the time, computer meant a person who calculated, and he really invents the idea of this one machine that does all the things you want a machine to do. It, you don't separately have a phone, you don't separately have a camera, you don't separately have a typewriter. You do all of them on the same machine. Yeah, I mean, I think the, 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 the key idea, really uh, the foundation of computer science really, yeah. is that there is computation and it doesn't matter what you run uh, computation on, the, the hardware is irrelevant, essentially. The hardware is irrelevant. And, yeah. you know, computation is computation. You can yeah. simulate any computer on any other computer as long as it's general enough. Mm -hmm. And you can also simulate the world with computers. You know, it might be expensive, it might be inefficient. You can, there is only one type of computation. That was mm -hmm. kind of the essential. Yeah. And this is hardware. In that analogy. And yeah, <laughs> we, you know, it's kind of wetware, but, wet but, um, <laughs> but it does computation. Yeah. And so, no. I mean, there have been arguments, you know, by physicists, among others, and, <laughs> and various people that uh, the, the kind of computation that takes place in the brain is so special that we, you know, we can't simulate it on the computer at all, or we can't simulate it without it being very expensive. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I don't think that's the case. Well, Max, I know you have feelings about the substrate. What's your yeah. take on this? First of all, on the very last point you made, there, John, with <laughs> with Roger Penrose saying that you can never I, I didn't mention his name, but yes. He didn't I, say I Roger actually, Penrose. I actually wrote a paper once, which is very respectful, full of equations, just doing a bunch of math, and then where you, which then got paraphrased in science by basically saying that Tegmark says Penrose is wrong. But <laughs> uh, I'm with you on, on this you. one. I think we are certainly machines. And I, I, in addition to agreeing with what you said, I think this is actually just the last part of a much longer, really beautiful story. If we go back 20,000 years and think about the people who lived on Earth, to them, not just their bodies, but everything around us also was rather magical. Why did the wind blow? And so on. And then gradually, a couple, <laughs> yeah, a couple of thousand, by, by 2,000 years ago, the Romans were building really good catapults and had an idea that certain things were really machines and you could build them and start seeing a method to the madness, right? And uh, if we had Galileo here, you could bring him in from 400 years ago on your new time machine, you know, he could have told us. Don't tell them about my time machine. He could have, <laughs> <laughs> still working on it. He could have told us exactly why, if you throw a hazelnut and an apple, why they would move in parabolas. But he had no clue why the hazelnut was brown and the apple was red and why the hazelnut was hard and why they. Apple was softer, because that seemed to be beyond science. Then we got this, the discovery of Maxwell's equations, which gave, uh, helped explain everything with colors. Then we got quantum mechanics, which explained why the hazelnut was hard and everything else about materials. And now, finally, people started to think, OK, now we, everything is sort of a machine, except nature is a machine, except living things. That's the weird part. And then, uh, as you were saying, people started to think, well, maybe yeah, this is actually kind of like a weird kind of motor. This is like a hinge, and but 
this. <laughs> the mind, that's still magic. Everything mm -hmm. else is a machine. And now Jan you know, and other AI pioneers have started to show that even this last mystery too is probably also something that can be brought in to the realm of science. And I, for one, don't think of this as so, sort of depressing farewell to magic. I think it's exciting that we can start to understand even this mystery. Well, let's talk about the mind. I mean, the mind is pretty hard to understand. We don't understand the human mind uh, very well. We, have, we thought by mapping it, we'd understand everything, and that really hasn't panned out. And so how much inspiration can we really draw from the human mind when trying to devise an artificial mind? Well, so there's really two, I mean, there's many approaches, but there's two major classes of approaches. One which is sort of top-down, where you try to get inspiration for how we think, uh, how humans uh, think through introspection, you know, we, we have logic, we have reasoning and things like that. And that's kind of the approach that a lot of people in AI in the 1970s and 80s followed. Uh, AI systems were built by essentially writing down rules and facts and then uh, uh, building inference engines that were able to deduct uh, new facts from the rules and the facts. And there is you know, still some of that going on. Um, and then there is the, the, the sort of more bottom-up uh, uh, inspiration from biology where we, we don't necessarily try to emulate the human uh, mind, but more the, 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 the basic function or the principles that, are, that underlie intelligence, whether it's human intelligence or animal intelligence, by the way. Uh, so we, uh, the, the level of intelligence that we have with our machines today, despite all the impressive feats that we can do with them, uh, doesn't approach the intelligence of a rat or a cat. Mm -hmm. uh, a cat or a rat is much more impressive than all the AI systems we've ever built. And that's still <laughs> going to be the case for a while. Um, so, you know, w it's more of a bottom-up approach where uh, instead of thinking about high-level reasoning and playing chess, we think about how do we perceive, how do we see, how do we, mm -hmm. um, you know, act. It is kind of astounding that computers, the stuff that we think very hard about, computers can do better than us, calculating crunching numbers, analyzing huge data sets, the stuff that we don't think about at all, they can't do. We, seeing a chair, identifying a cat, that's something that's very hard for a computer. Right, so it turns out the, the things we do consciously are actually relatively simple usually, uh, right? It used to be that you can have a career as a mathematician with, if all you did was calculating logarithm tables. Um, but, you know, now you, you have this on, you know, a $10 calculator or on uh -huh. your so free software on your smartphone. So. Uh, a lot of those things, like playing chess, like, um, you know, it used to be part of AI to do path planning. So path planning is you have a complicated map and you ask a computer to, you know, find the shortest path between, you know, city A and city B, right? Your GPS does this every day, you know, Google Map mm -hmm. does this every day. Mm -hmm. We don't consider this AI anymore, it's just an algorithm, right? right? Uh, but that used to be part of AI. Compilers, well, you know, that turn yeah, uh, yeah. high-level language into machine language, that used to be part of AI yeah. too. So all of those things, once they're solved, we don't consider them part of AI. And all of those are very sort of high level things that only a few humans can do. What we, ki what we could yeah. not do with AI until very recently yeah. is all the stuff that everybody does and every animal does. Takes for granted. I know Max wants to jump in here. Yeah, I, I think uh, this connects beautifully with what we said just earlier here about how everything used to seem mysterious and then the part that still seems beyond science and mysterious keeps shrinking. I think now that what's left that we still don't understand is what we define as AI. So before playing chess was AI, oh no, no, that's now that's just easy machine. Uh, and now, and then being able to tell cats from dogs and having face recognition, once you guys at Facebook totally automated this and everything worked, oh, that's not AI anymore. It's just image recognition and convnets. But true AI, oh, that's the sort of mysterious human consciousness which machines still can't do. And um, I, I have a lot of colleagues whom I really respect who I think fall into this trap of carbon chauvinism, where they still <laughs> insist on believing that you can only do that ultimate human intelligence if you're made of s carbon atoms. <laughs> and I just don't think there's any evidence for it at all. I'm curious if you disagree. Uh, well, no. Um, <laughs> Come on, you guys, got to disagree. Not, I'm certainly not a, a carbon chauvinist. Um, <laughs> I wouldn't be in that business if I were, I guess. Uh, no, but I, I think there is one big difference between uh, the, the, the type of problems that we now consider solved and not part of AI anymore, and the kind of stuff we, we've been, you know, that have become successful over the last few years, it's learning. So now we have, 
I mean, machine learning has, has been around for a very long time. The, the first learning machines, there were basically two, really two pioneers uh, in machine learning, uh, a guy called Samuel in the, in the 50s who built one of the first chess players that was capable of learning, sort of you know, refining itself by playing against humans or against itself. And then another model was the Perceptron, so that's from 1957. It was not a program on a digital computer, it was actually an analog computer. So it was, it, like, it was like hardwired. By an analog computer, you mean they literally had plugged wires right. into ports, and then if you wanted to change the program, you had to change the wiring, literally. Well, so it's not even a program, because yeah. this thing was uh, you know, computing very simple things like, like weighted sums, and mm -hmm. the, it had potentiometers to change the weights with motors on them, so right. you, the learning algorithm would, you press a button and the motors would go <laughs> and that's, that's how it learned, by changing mm -hmm. the, the weights in the system. So this was uh, built at Cornell, and um, and it, it, it really kind of changed the mind of uh, the people about the, 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 the fact that first you could get inspiration from biology because this thing was in, in inspired a little bit by what we knew about you know, how neurons learn and you know, mm -hmm. synaptic connections change and all that mm -hmm. stuff. Um, and that you could actually implement this on a real computer. You know, a few years later, it was really uh, a program on a, on a regular computer and now you can write this in three lines of Python. But, um, <laughs> But you know, there was a difference though, because there was this idea originally that you would write a program software and you would pipe this program into this universal machine which could execute any program that you gave it. But the idea of programming intelligence is no longer really taken seriously, is it? I mean, wouldn't you think that a mind complex enough of being acknowledged as an intelligence could not possibly be pre-programmed? Right, so uh, actually my, you know, uh, the, the how I got into into this mm -hmm. uh, is discovering the, the the I mean I've always been sort of interested by the the mystery of intelligence. You know, it's one of the big scientific questions of our time. What is intelligence mm -hmm. all about? You know, another one is what's the universe made of? Yeah. And then, you know, another one is you know what's life all about? Mm -hmm. um, so I was always you know fascinated by this question: how you know intelligence emerged and what is you know etc. And you know clearly learning plays a very important role. Mm -hmm. And so when I discovered when I was in college that uh, people actually worked on learning machines. I was absolutely fascinated. That's the, you know, I was totally hooked, and that's, mm -hmm. that's when I uh, started working on this. And uh, I, I agree that you cannot separate intelligence from learning. I don't believe we can you know, design and build uh, a complete AI system. We mm -hmm. can't even build a computer vision system that works without yeah. learning. Right, so Max, do you really think that, okay, so Jan initiated a major shift in computer science with the deep learning and the, the the net, the neural networks that, the artificial neural networks that really do model human neural networks to some extent, or did, did they? Okay, but hold on, I'm gonna get next. Um, do you think that that's gonna be the path to AI, deep learning, that we're gonna teach machines how to correct their behavior, analyze big data sets, you know, weight sums in a certain way so that they actually learn? Do you think that that's gonna be the path? The path? A path? I think it's gonna be one key part of the puzzle is what I think. I think that... Um, so in that, the, in that I, you scenario, know, you don't program, right? You just sort of give it some data. I think uh, we're a little bit too obsessed about how our own brain works when we envision the first ever superhuman artificial intelligence. Um, but that just that kind of shows a lack of imagination. You know, if you think about, suppose we were having this, the, this uh, Psycon minus 200, you know, 200 years ago, and we're thinking, I wonder what the first flying machine is going to be like. Is it going to have feath black feathers or white feathers? You know, uh, when the Wright brothers actually, for the first time, built a, fly built a flying machine, it wasn't the mechanical bird because it turned out there was a much easier way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's going to be the same with intelligence. Why did nature build flying machines with feathers first? Because for nature, it wasn't enough that the thing would fly. It also had to be self-assembling and self-repairing and so on for Darwinian evolution to do it, right? And look at our brains. Why do we have so many different kinds of neurons? Why are our brains so complicated? Even though Jan LeCun's neural networks have only one kind of neurons, maybe, with a relo activation function, right? It's because this has to be self-assembling, self-repairing, and all sorts of other things that an engineer doesn't care about. My guess is that there are significantly simpler and easier ways to get there than by just trying to figure out exactly how our brain works. And I think, obviously, the ideas we have heard about with deep learning will be a key part of it. I also think, though, that there will probably be some other aspects of, of what we sometimes call GoFi, 
good old-fashioned artificial intelligence, <laughs> you know, the more logic-based, where you have to build a model of the world, it'll probably help complement mm -hmm. the learning so that these systems become, yeah, get sort of get the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. yeah, I think that's the question of biological inspiration. Like, how much inspiration can you get from biology? I'm going to do an exercise here. Um, mm -hmm. Who here has, uh, has heard of a guy called Clément Ader, or you know, in English pronunciation, Clément Ader? <laughs> okay, one, one person. person. Are you French? <laughs> Are you an aviation buff? <laughs> yeah, right. Okay, so this is guy. Oh, okay, two another people. another person here. <laughs> Are you French? He's okay. an aviation buff. <laughs> Generally, when I ask this question and, and someone raises their hand, they they have some connection with France. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> this guy uh, built an airplane in the shape of a bat in the uh, late 19th century, steam-powered. Mm -hmm. It was the first, uh, the first heavier-than-air thing to take off on its own power. It was completely uncontrollable. The guy had no interest in stability and <laughs> any of that stuff. And when you look at uh, uh, pictures uh, or reproductions of this, this airplane, it really looks like a bat. It's just a bat with propellers. It's not doesn't flap the, the wings, but it's got propellers. And um, the reason you never heard about him, even though he was the first guy to take, to take off on his own power, is that, first of all, he didn't believe in open source. You know, he kind of kept everything secret a little bit. Um, but mainly because there was no follow-up on this because he was too hypnotized by the biological inspiration and didn't think about understanding the underlying principles. So what the Wright brothers did that he didn't do uh, was you know, actually studying uh, flight as an engineering discipline, you know, building uh, wind tunnels and, you know, studying stability and then building models and, and gliders and stuff like that, right? Um, and, and, and so they succeeded because they kind of understood, at least intuitively, what the underlying principles were, whereas this guy came out there didn't. Um, in fact, he has one legacy, which is that the name he gave to, the, to his airplane is Avion, and that became the, the, the name, the word for airplane in French and in Spanish and Portuguese. So I this idea that, okay, let's not model an artificial intelligence after the one example we really have of advanced, you know, human, I mean, I mean let's not get overly self-congratulatory, but, um, but if we don't and we don't program it, how will we know when we have it? I mean, if we're not literally writing a code that's intelligent and we're not modeling it after a biological system, we're letting it learn and develop its own intelligence in a way. It's kind of like letting it evolve. <laughs> well, How will we recognize it when it happens? Is it possible that it will be so different that we won't even see it? We won't even understand it, or at least not at first. Well, there's many ways in which it can be different. I mean, we do, it's, it is useful to get inspiration from, mm -hmm. from biology, but you don't want to copy the details that you don't understand. You want to figure out what the underlying principles are, mm -hmm. right? Like building airplanes, you want to understand aerodynamics, and that explains how our uh, airplane and birds fly. Mm -hmm. Is there an equivalent of aerodynamics for intelligence? You know, some theory of intelligence that would explain how humans and animals and, and computers can, can become intelligent. So we do get inspiration from biology, so neural networks. So do you think that there is a fundamental kind of principle of intelligence that will be the same amongst all so intelligent entities? I don't know if there is, but I'm working on this assumption. Okay. <laughs> because, because it would be Famous really cool Lazarus. if that were, <laughs> and it would, you know, um, it, you know, it means the problem is solvable, right? Uh, whereas uh, if, uh, like my dear colleague Gary Marcus believes, the brain is a collection of hacks, he calls this a kludge, uh, mm -hmm. he has a little book with that title, actually, mm -hmm. um, then we're screwed. We can't, there's no way we can build intelligent machines because, you know, we have to basically... Uh, uh, kind of retrace evolution, and that's going to be very difficult from an engineering point of view. So I hope there is an underlying principle. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm working on this assumption. Max, but do you think that there is? That there's a unifying principle of intelligence that will be the same, will have a commonality? Actually, let's talk first about what we mean by intelligence so we can really answer this question honestly. But, uh, maybe by making an analogy to the mental performance of intelligence to physical performance in sports. I, if I told you that uh, athletic ability can be measured by a single number called the uh, athletic quotient, the AQ. And whichever athlete in the Olympics has the highest AQ is going to win all the sports, from the swimming to the pole vault. You would just boo me out of the room, wouldn't you, right? And of course, it's exactly the same with intelligence. It's how good you are at performing various tasks. You can have very na narrow intelligence, like the chess playing computer who couldn't even beat me at tic-tac-toe. Or you can have very broad intelligence, like a human child who can learn 
almost everything, which is sort of the holy grail for us to build in, in machine form. Uh, my guess, so, so, so first of all, what this means is we're defining intelligence not as something mysterious, but in terms of performance, what the thing can actually do. So of course we're going to know when we have it. If you can just tell it you know, to, t to teach your next lecture and write your next book, and it does, you'll feel that was pretty smart. <laughs> um, so now you look, and second, so you asked me this question about whether I think our brain is a hack, and if so, if I would all get all depressed. Even if it turns out that our brain is a bit of a kludge, I still don't think we're screwed. Because I think just because our brain is a kludge, maybe, maybe just like a bird is also a little bit of a kludge, an airplane is very simple. So maybe if we study the foundations carefully, like Jan was advocating, we can discover much simpler ways also of building intelligence, which is not so kludgy. Well, let's, let's compare um, our brains to computational brains. I mean, we know what is our brain can process something like fire 20 times a second, is that 200 maybe? 200 times a second, something like that? You guys must Sometimes know better than I do. up to 1,000, but yeah, And a million times half. faster is an average pretty basic computer, about a million times faster. Uh, you don't really care about that. No, it's not true. Um, <laughs> so we have... Uh, Finally, a disagreement. <laughs> We have 10 to the 14 neurons, roughly. 10 to the 11, but 10 to the 14, 10 to the 14 synapses. synapses. Yeah. Hundreds Thank you. of Thank billions. <laughs> 10 well, hundreds of trillions or hundreds of billions. Well, maybe you have 10 to the Maybe you guys have 10 to the 14. <laughs> yes, we have 10 to the 14. Neurons. That's why we're physicists. <laughs> you're, you're the theoretical <laughs> physicists. Yeah, exactly. So, um, but I only have 10 to the 14 synapses. I do feel bad about neurons. that. Um, Depends on how much we drank last night, I guess. <laughs> It's, it's the French wine, actually. But the, um, so each synapse, uh, you know, can get activated maybe roughly a dozen times a, se a second. Okay, so that's that's a lot. That's yeah. a lot. It's right? not bad. Yeah, it's ten to the seventeen operations per second. Mm -hmm. Now those operations are actually complicated. Like if you want to model them with a the computer, you probably take take you know maybe a hundred or a thousand operations to model what really goes on in the synapse. Mm -hmm. So we're up to you know ten to the nineteen, ten to the twenty operations per second. Now. Of course, only 1% or so of the neurons are active at any one time in the brain, so you can knock off you know, a, couple, a couple zeros. So let's say 10 to the 18 operations per second. Uh, the fastest GPU card... A million card trillion. Pardon? A million trillion. A million I'm just trillion. translating it into English, that's all right. Okay, yeah. A million trillion. <laughs> yeah, or, you know... A lot. 10 billion billion. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like it better this way. Um, <laughs> All of the AI programs that we run now, where we train neural nets, they run on GPUs. You know the gaming cards that you, you know, you can you can get for a few hundred bucks. Uh, it's the same it's the same circuits that we use, um, and we just, you know, plug a bunch of them. Each of those nowadays, the modern ones, are capable of about 10 trillion uh, operations per second. You know, 10 to the 13. Uh, so you need a whole bunch of them to reach 10 to the 18, mm -hmm. uh, and even then. Uh, it's not entirely clear. Each of each of those cards consumes about 250 watts, and you need you know hundreds of thousands of them. Our brain consumes about 25 watts. So in terms of technology, mm -hmm. uh, sort of re you know how refined the technology of our brain is, mm -hmm. it's it's incredibly far from what we can do today. Mm -hmm. Well, sorry, Max, did you want to jump in? Uh, I completely agree with you on there. <coughs> the, the evolution has done a spectacular job on the hardware with our energy efficiency, which is something evolution cares enormously about because a lot of people <laughs> used to starve to death, so <laughs> kept optimizing that part. Whereas evolution didn't give a hoot about making it simple, right? as long as it could self-assemble. Who cared if human scientists later would understand it? Um, but uh, so I, th I think you have to be very careful, though. A lot of people say, oh, it's going to be so hard to ever get to human level intelligence, and then they try to figure out how much compute power you need to actually simulate the human brain. But I think that's kind of misleading, actually. It's to, o o about as silly as if I ask, how many of my brains would you need to like, simulate a pocket calculator and its ability to multiply numbers? The answer, like, probably millions, because I'm very slow at multiplying numbers, right? Uh, the more I fair question is comparing <coughs> how much compute power you need to actually accomplish the same stuff that our brains do. do. And I agree with Jan that right now, that's so much compute hardware that it costs a ton of money. <coughs> so what that means is, you know, you don't, even if we knew how to build it, you wouldn't have to worry about it putting you all out of work <coughs> because if it costs 
10 million dollars an hour to rent buy that cloud computing time for Amazon and you're willing to do the job for less than 10 million, 10 million an hour they're still going to want to hire you right <laughs> but for just the proof of principle of to show that we really kind of understand how to make this level of intelligence it would already be very interesting and my guess maybe we can finally find something to disagree on is that we're already at the point in our hardware now where we're not actually limited by the hardware anymore but really by the software by the architecture. Yeah, I'll disagree with that. <laughs> <laughs> um, actually, you know, we, we train neural nets in relatively stupid ways that are nothing like uh, humans and animals train themselves. We're, we're missing basic principles there, but, uh, but one fact that we know is that the bigger we make them, the better they work. And so we are limited by, by computation. The reason why the neural nets that we use at Facebook, for example, for, you know, you know, recognizing what's in photos and generating captions for them and all that stuff. Uh, the reason why those neural nets have a limited size is because we have to uh, recognize about two billion photos per day. And you know, we can afford to do it if it's a gigantic neural net that requires you know, a bank of GPUs to run. So this has to run in you know, uh, less than a you know, few milliseconds on a standard CPU. That's, that's why we, we crunch it down. So um, indeed, uh, Hardware is a, is, a, is a big limitation, both for uh, scientific experiments and for practical applications. So just to push back a little bit so we can finally get some disagreement here. Uh, you mentioned money when you are explained why we're not there yet. Be and there, be because you said that, yeah, it costs so much to try to get a lot of compute power. But if, if we ignore the money factor, right, then Hans Moravec, famous uh, robotics pioneer, he, he made this really interesting estimate where he tried to do a fair comparison. And he looked at the simplest computation that the brain does that we actually pretty much understand, namely what the retina in the back of your eye does to um, do the first rough processing of what comes in on your biological camera and compare that to what you need to do in a neural network. And based on that, he, his estimate is that what you need to do the full brain is something like the Sunway Taihu Light, which is the world's biggest supercomputer right now, of course, renting that would be ridiculously expensive for normal commercial tax, so we wouldn't. But my feeling still is that the reason we can't just simulate John LeCun's brain outright is because as opposed to the retina and the visual system and so on, the, we have still have very little clue about what's really happening here and sure. at a higher level cognition. Yeah, uh, I mean, we don't, we don't have the basic principles. So people have done experiments that are, in my opinion, not very useful, where they claim you know, using a super IBM supercomputer of some kind, they claim to have simulated the whole brain of a rat. In fact, they didn't. What they did was run a program that consumed, uh, you know, computer cycles that kind of simulate randomly connected neurons, you know, that are roughly connected like the neurons in a, in a, in a rat brain, you know, in roughly the same number. But this thing doesn't do anything. Haven't we simulated the brain of a worm? We, right, so the proverbial <laughs> we. Interesting, right? So C elegance, it's like right? Like 302 the neurons, or 302 neurons. That C elegance, you know, so one millimeter long uh, worm. Uh, you know, biologists love love these guys because they reproduce really quickly. They have 302 neurons. They all have a, you know, they're all known on a first name basis. They're all always the same 302. They are almost always connected the same way with very little variations. We know exactly the connection pattern, and we have no idea how it works. <laughs> right. um, yeah, so that's what I mean. Like when when you simulate it properly, is it to the point where you can't look under the hood anymore? Well, but this right. this I can comment on a little bit actually because we're actually doing a project at MIT now with my lab and Steve Favell's lab and Ed Boyden's lab, w w exactly with the C. elegans worm. They're super cute, by the way. These little wormies. They're they're like a millimeter and long. And then you decapitate them. No, we're very nice to them. We even give them names. You can you can see them with your eye because and and they have their little wormy lives and stuff and. And, but what happens is when we try to simulate them now on the computer, simulations don't match very well what the worm actually does. But I don't think that's at all because there's a secret fairy dust life sauce in the worm. You know, that we, it, it's simply because the data we have from which we try to reconstruct the connection strengths in those synapses is really sucky. So if actually right now we're sort of on the cusp of getting the technology. That's what we're working on now. MIT to, to, for the first time, be able to measure those numbers well enough that the simulation kind of ought to work. And it's so going to be really interesting if we, can, if we can do that. So I completely agree with Jan. If we can't even do the wor the, that the worm. little wormy yet, yeah. we certainly can't do the mouse. Well, let's talk about the possibility, okay, you don't program it, uh, 
maybe deep learning is only an initial phase, but ultimately that the artificial intelligence is something that we hope will evolve, right? And it will evolve in some very complicated way that won't necessarily be that transparent to us. And so I want to, I just actually, before we, we address this, I just want to think about how evolution worked for us, right? For a long time, single-celled organisms waffled on the earth without breaking the energetic barrier. So life was driven by optimizing energy consumption and metabolism. So that's not the case with artificial intelligence, right? That it's a totally different principle. So yes, our brains took a long time to evolve. And as you said, they're optimized for different things than we expect from a machine. So is there some way that we can conceive of a digital evolution of an artificial intelligence where we just kickstart it like the frothy soup of primordial uh, animal matter. Ah, I, that's Jules. I recognize your voice. Hey man, <laughs> wait for the question and answer session. <laughs> so there used to be a, a whole field of investigation called artificial life uh, in the 90s. It kind of died out a little bit, but the idea was exactly that. You would run you know, what's called genetic algorithms or evolutionary algorithms now and sort of you know, simulate a kind of prim primordial soup and then you know, have organisms that evolve out of it. And you know, there's been some success with this. Uh, don't go very far, it's not very useful, but it is cute, it's, it's kind of cool. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the, you know, the field kind of died out. Now there are people uh, certainly in the context of, of deep learning who are uh, using these kinds of, alg of search algorithms to kind of look for the appropriate architecture for, for neural nets. So instead of having the architecture of the neural nets, how the neurons are connected and things like this, designed by a, by a person, um, you kind of parameterize it and then you, you let the learning algorithm select what the right set of parameters are. And then for each of the selection of the parameters, you train the machine. And then in the end, you see which one works best. So it's a kind of you know, numerical evolution, if you want. Mm -hmm. But it's completely... Um, uh, control this, uh, you know, control environment. It's, Is that uh, the problem really that we're limited. controlling it too much? <laughs> no, I don't think that's the, the problem. I mean, I, I think we're limited again by, uh, by compute power. The only mm -hmm. labs who are able to do this kind of stuff at a grand scale are basically, you know, companies like, like you know, Facebook, Google, and Microsoft that have, mm -hmm. you know, banks of those GPUs, but yeah. it's hard to do in an uh, academic environment. Max? Yeah. E even though artificial life kind of faded, uh, I feel it's come roaring one of the coolest ideas of artificial life has kind of come roaring back now with a new name. It goes by the geeky uh, terminology of, of, of or adversarial training, pioneered by Ian Goodfellow and others. And, and something else. Ad adversarial, oh, well, let me explain what I mean by the idea. So when, when for example, um, so if you have two AIs that are competing against each other, one is trying to thwart the other in some way, they can kind of egg each other on. Um, Self-play is an idea which is a little bit related to this. You, you know, you raise your hand if you heard of when Go when uh, DeepMind's AlphaGo beat the best human Go players recently. Yeah, so part of the way that machine got so smart was by playing copies of itself. And you know how it is. If you play a lot of chess against someone who's much worse than you, you're not going to improve, right? But if you play against someone really good, you'll keep getting better. And I, I feel that that's one of the core ideas of life that, that made comp Earth so complex. We started with this boring soup of uh, quarks in this universe with nothing interesting happening. And, and then it's well known that, it, as I said, if you play against a good opponent, you improve faster. So if you live in a complicated environment like Brooklyn, you can really benefit a lot from being smart. And evolution will favor that. But then, you, if, then your species will multiply and you may become the environment for all the other organisms who now also be benefit from being smarter. And I feel that that's kind of why ultimately things got more and more interesting and complex on Earth. And maybe some of those ideas are going to keep fueling um, AI development now, even though w without us needing to go through you know, full-blown, super costly mm -hmm. artificial life simulations. But Sorry, Jan, did you want to reply? Yeah, I mean, there's a bunch of, uh, I mean, certainly adversarial training is one of the coolest ideas over the last few years in machine learning. Uh, I, I wouldn't really characterize as, as two neural nets sort of playing against each other. It's more like one is, one is teaching the other or is one rating. One is evaluating the other. One is evaluating the other. Teaching but they, skills or learning but it, skills. That's right, but they're both trained at the same time. So the, the, the one that, uh, you know, make proposal trains the one that evaluates those proposals and they both train at the same time. It's a very, very cool idea. Um, but there are also experiments with uh, kind of multi-agent AI when you, you train uh, multiple copies of the, the same neural net or, 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 or several uh, different neural nets. 
uh, in an environment so that they learn to cooperate, maybe they learn to communicate, things like that. So those are kind of interesting experiments nowadays. But it's very preliminary. I mean, none of those things is particularly smart. And well, there's something interesting here, which I think is worth bringing up, which is the idea of consciousness and why consciousness emerged because of the process of evolution. So at some stage, the small size of our cranium and the limited processes we could actually execute meant that we had to be very fast at data processing, but we didn't actually have the computational power that an actual computer does now. So we had to symbolize or make a map of the world, right? Or that's, that's one of the ideas of why consciousness emerges, because it's so much faster for me to look and say chair than it is for me to analyze all the data and process it all, which I couldn't possibly do. Now, a computer, in some sense, is the other way around. It can analyze all the data you give it, process it incredibly quickly, basically you know, executing things at the speed of light, but it can't say chair. It doesn't have that map of the world. So do you think that consciousness is going to be important in artificial intelligence, or is it something that a computer won't need because it won't have the limitations that we have? Um, I'm going to make, uh, you know, very perhaps controversial, at least maybe not for Sorry. you, but for <laughs> some people who were in this position uh, before, mm -hmm. like Christoph Koch yeah. and, yes. and David Chalmers. Yes, our last event. I think uh, consciousness is an epiphenomenon of being smart. Uh, I don't think there is anything particular to it. I mean. Mm -hmm. A lot of people are asking themselves metaphysical questions about it. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is much to it. I mean, you know, I mean, I, 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 all of us have kind of ideas about. I Overblown. mean, first of all, you know, is a, you know, is is an orangutan conscious? Mm -hmm. Is it? Is it? I don't know. Is it? Okay. <laughs> I mean, they are almost as smart as we are. <laughs> they don't have language. They're mm -hmm. not social animals. They mm -hmm. they live solitary lives, mm -hmm. and they 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 pretty. I mean, they can build tools and stuff. They, they must have a map of the world. Recognize yeah. each other. I mean, an every, internal map. every animal has a map of the world. <laughs> uh, even the but a computer ones. doesn't. Well, I mean, some computers do. You know, there are robots that can run around, and they do have a map of the world. Mm -hmm. No, what they don't have is generic models of the world. Mm -hmm. So, uh, in my opinion, the essence of intelligence is the ability to predict. It's the ability to predict the future from the present and the past. It's the ability to fill in the blanks. You know, fill in partial information. Uh, you have partial information given by your, your, your senses, and you're sort of estimating the state of the world from this. And that's, you know, the essence of intelligence. You can use your ability to predict to plan a sequence of action to reach a particular goal. Because you have a model of the world, you know what sequence of actions to take to get the world to reach a particular state, right? So that's the idea of planning, uh, another interesting topic in AI. Um, and so this ability to face a situation and immediately understand the situation in such a way that you can predict what's going to happen, you can predict what you can act upon. Uh, that's really the essence of, in of intelligence. And I think it's related to consciousness in the sense that we sort of, it looks like we have, you know, we have a lot of kind of subconscious processes taking place in our, in our heads, the things that we can't really express, like vision. We can't, we can't explain how we do vision, right? Or addition. And then we have the things that we can the, the explicit conscious process of reasoning that we can explain. Um, and we have this sort of generic world simulator in our frontal cortex that essentially allows us to kind of uh, model the world, predict what's going to happen in the world. That's, that's really consistent with intelligence. Now, to configure the simulator for a particular situation, we have to have some control. Mm -hmm. There's some place of our brain that has to figure out, like, what should I pay attention to today? You know, what should I configure my world simulator to pay attention to? And that might be kind of a one element of consciousness. Max? Yeah, it's, I, I've noticed that when people disagree with one another about consciousness, it usually turns out it's because they define consciousness in different ways. And I think this is happening again on the stage, which is fascinating. You talked about consciousness in the context of maps of the world. You talked about consciousness in terms of having a self-model. You also mentioned in the context of attention. And I, th I agree with you both that if you define it in this way or that way, there's nothing to it. It's just an aspect of intelligence. And even an, I would argue that even an operating system on my laptop has a model of itself it's a, because it's a program and it's running on and it knows that it's running. <coughs> However... Does it know it's running? I don't know. I don't know about that. But, but uh, <laughs> the way I define consciousness, which is the same way that David Chalmers does, is simply as subjective experience. Right now, I look at you, I see colors, I hear sounds, I experience emotions, and that to me is something which 
there is nowhere to be found in the equations of physics that I usually teach at work. You know, I exp it's an un <coughs> it feels like an extra thing. Uh, if I look at that exit sign, it looks red. If I look at something there, it looks yellow. Why don't they feel the other way around, those two colors? There's nothing in the laws of physics to this. In physics, you learn all about wavelengths and frequencies, not about how the color red and, and yellow feel, right? So to me, this is just another area where science so far has failed to uh, explain some phenomena I actually observed. Uh, some people say this is BS and, and for a different reason. Like me. Namely, like, yeah, <laughs> and I respect that. And you can say I, it's BS because who cares if, some, if somebody else is conscious or whatever. But I feel it's actually very, very important. First of all, if, if, I, have, um, if I have a helper ro robot in the future, maybe I buy it from you, you know, I would like to know whether it's conscious or not, because if it's, if it's just like a zombie going through the motions but <laughs> not experiencing anything, I won't feel guilty about giving it boring chores and turning it off, right? Uh, on the other hand, if I know it's conscious, maybe I'll feel happy that it has an experience. Uh, maybe that'll prevent me from feeling creeped out by the fact that it's just faking it the whole, you know, the whole time. And, and most importantly of all, I, I, challenge, I would like to ch give a little challenge to both of you guys. Uh, tell me, what is wrong with rape and torture? But you have to answer this question without making any reference to subjective experience, okay? You can only answer by talking about why are these particular motions of quarks and electrons that correspond to that somehow worse than the motions when there is no rape and torture. Oh, that's an easy one. Okay. Nice. No problem. I'm turning my mic off now. That's an easy one. <laughs> it reduces the long-term complexity of the universe. Uh, a okay, well, listen, before we get too and down... Why is that a bad thing if, if the whole thing is just a plane for empty benches because there's no, ex no one experiencing well, so it? Do you Be because as you said it earlier, the whole purpose of the universe is to become more complex, right? You talked about the quark soup and everything and evolution. Well, we, since we have artists here in the building, fi very fine artists, I would say that, that actually th the reason that art is beautiful and the, the galaxies are beautiful and so on uh, is because we are experiencing them. If there were no experience whatsoever, I think the whole thing would just be a giant waste of space. So in that sense, you said that the meaning of our purpose of our universe is to get complex, whatever. I would beg to differ there. I, I feel that we shouldn't look to our universe to give meaning to us. It's we, with our experience, who give meaning to our universe. So I think the, the whole idea of uh, qualia, because philosophers call this qualia, right? The, how you interpret percepts and everything. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, you, you would feel bad about turning off a robot if you were conscious. Like, do, would you feel bad about turning off a hamster? Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> and are they conscious? <laughs> that they do have a subjective experience. They yeah, yes. of so the question is, for example. will AI have it? Do you believe that AI, I mean, I've heard you say something to this effect a little bit earlier, will they be zombies effectively emulating everything that they think or that we've programmed them to emulate or influence them to emulate, but actually not having qualia? I think for a while they'll be like hamsters. They'll be like which? Hamsters. Hamsters. You know, That's mice, not bad. rats, maybe cats. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very far from this still. Mm -hmm. So, um, y you know, it's something that we really have to realize. It's not because we have computers that can beat people at, at chess or go, or we have machines that can recognize, uh, you know, plants from their, the shape of their leaves or, or, you know, obscure breeds of dogs that we have intelligent machines. And the reason is because all of those machines are trained, uh, but they all use two types of learning. One is called supervised learning. So supervised learning is kind of like showing a, a picture book to a, to a young child, right? You, you point to the picture of an elephant and you know, after a few examples of elephant, the, the child understands what it is. Um, with computers, you need thousands of examples of each category, but, but, but eventually it gets it. human beings are involved in labeling that process, right? So human beings are still That's right. crucial That's right. to make the large data set. So there is no yeah. Google Translate if there aren't human translators. No, that's right, exactly. So translation works this way. I mean, all of the applications of machine learning that you see today, mm -hmm. translation, image recognition, speech recognition, cell driving cars, everything, that's all uh, largely supervised learning. I mean, 95%, 99% of it is supervised learning. So um, and the, the second type of learning that there is is reinforcement learning. So that works only for games. And the reason is because it's very inefficient. It requires millions and millions and millions of trials. So it works for games because you can play millions of games. You know, the AlphaGo, the DeepMind system played more uh, Go uh, 
games than all of humanity in the last 3,000 years uh, to train itself. Um, but, but it doesn't really work in the real, in the real world. So we're missing you know, the ability of a cat in just a few days or months to uh, basically control its body and do kind of amazing things. We have nowhere near this. We have no idea how that works. Mm -hmm. The ability of people to acquire common sense by basically figuring out how the world works. We have no idea how that happens. You know, babies learn about things like uh, object permanence, the fact that an object is still there even if it's hidden. Um, you know, babies learn this by the age of two months or so, which is why peekaboo is so funny. Um, <laughs> and, you know, things like the fact that an object that is not supported is going to fall. Babies learn this between the age of six and eight months. So all of those sort of basic things of uh, intuitive physics, uh, we're not born with them, we learn them. Uh, we have no idea how to do this with machines. Mm -hmm. that's, that's what we call unsupervised learning or predictive learning. This, right. this idea of you know, learning models of the world. Right. So I'm dying to ask Jan a quick question about hamsters. May I? Please. <laughs> yeah, so many of my colleagues take for granted that consciousness is just the same thing as intelligence. So if you make something smart enough, it's automatically going to be conscious in my sense of having a subjective experience also. But there are also colleagues of mine who don't think they're the same. Like the neuroscientist Giulio Tononi thinks that some intelligent things will be conscious and some won't. Yeah, so my it's question it's to you, Jan, which I'm really curious about. pretty far though, huh? This guy. Yeah, but it was, so was Galileo at his time. You know, I try to be open-minded. You know, my job as a scientist isn't to believe things. It's to, to consider all the different ideas and try to test them in experiments. So my question for you, I promised I was going to get back to your hamster. Since you said that you felt that neural networks maybe are a little bit at the level of hamsters and you felt that you would, f you said you would feel guilty about killing a hamster, I think, right? So, so my I question is this. I don't feel guilty about killing a hamster, but I, okay, I so my question You guys don't want to get a lot of mail about killing hamsters. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really but not. My, uh, I, I did not say that neural nets were the level Okay, but let me just finish the question. Then, so, so, so I'm very curious what you think. So if you feel, would feel guilty about killing a hamster, do you ever have a little pang of guilt when you power down your GPUs at night? Nope. <laughs> Why not? Well, I mean, for, for a number of reasons. Uh, I get kind of aggravated. I would get aggravated. If uh, the computer crashes and you know the configuration of weights of the neural nets that you know took two weeks to train was lost, and it's kind of the same, uh, you know, if it took you know two years to train, it's kind of the same as killing a hamster kind of thing. Not not because the neural net is is conscious or anything like that, not because it has qualias or whatever, but it's because you've invested things in it, right? You so you know when you have a pet or uh, or, or you know, a friend or, or family member, you invest emotional uh, value to it. You give you give it value because you invested things in it, and so uh, losing that relationship is a loss, right? And uh, the same way that losing a file on the computer is a loss, mm -hmm. right? It's not because the file is conscious, but it's because you invested things in it. So there, there's two there's two parts to um, to kind of uh, uh, you know disappearing information or complexity, one is in, in your immediate environment, one is the fact that uh, you don't have access to it anymore, uh, so you, you, you perceive it as a loss. But the other thing is that this, this other entity that you know, suddenly disappeared uh, also lost something, perhaps. So right, that's what I was getting at. Well, yeah. so conscious or not, Max, I know that you're actually concerned about the emergence of artificial intelligence at a sort of existential level. You have concerns that uh, human beings will be a step in evolution where their ultimate um, impact is really to initiate its successor. Is that right? Well, newspapers love to spin this mm -hmm. into some kind of doom and gloom story. Uh, as you can why tell, I'm a pretty yeah, cheerful Fooms guy. Yeah. Huh? But they so call it Fooms Day. <laughs> I don't know why. Fo or, or you said you taught me Fooms Day yeah, earlier Fooms Day tonight. Yeah, Fooms Day instead right? of Doomsday. I don't know why, actually. Maybe somebody That's knows. Somebody will tell us later. If it only take 10 seconds, it's because some people refer to this idea of an intelligence explosion as foom. Ah. So foom's day would be when this hypothetical <laughs> event happens. But, it's, but in terms of concerns, I mean, first of all, of course, if you, if you, it, you asked if it's a doom and gloom idea that one day there'll be other life forms which outlive us and so on, you know, if you're a parent, which you are, right, if, if your children grow up to do great things, that you don't, could only dream of doing and they outlive you, you're not gonna find that depressing. You're gonna probably feel very proud and happy, right? Mm -hmm. On the other hand, if you raise a child who turns out to be the next Adolf Hitler and kills everybody and does all sorts of things that you really don't like, you'd be less psyched about it. So 
<laughs> what do you do? You don't spend all your time just f freaking out about this, but you, you put a lot of effort into how you raise your child. That's what you do with a lot of care. And similarly, I think if we ever create machines that are smarter than us, we should put a lot of care into how we raise them and making sure that whatever goals they have are well aligned with our goals. It's a yeah. value alignment idea, right. that they have to be aligned with our values. Will that be hard to do? Well, uh, so it's, it's based on the idea that if you build an intelligent system, uh, at least in my mind, uh, you know, not, not everybody agrees with this, but there are sort of three major components. Right? One component is this sort of world simulator, this prediction engine I was, I was talking about earlier. Um, the second component is uh, kind of a, uh, an objective function, uh, something, an objective that the, the machine or the intelligent entity needs to satisfy. We have this in, your bra in our brain. Uh, it, uh, this is what you know, makes us wake up every morning, uh, not all of us, but you know. Um, and and you know, do the things we do. We have basic drives that make us do the things we do, and, um, and, and, and this is what makes us human. You know, like uh, seeking the company of other humans, for example. We do this because we are social animals. We have a special piece of our brain that tells us to be happy when that happens. It's not the case for orangutans. They don't mm -hmm. want to mm -hmm. meet other orangutans. So know, why do we have situations. this expectation that we can impose this on, on a completely different kind of entity that we're not even modeling after our own minds? Right, so, so this is this prediction engine. There is the cost function. There is also another module that sort of decides what actions to take to kind of satisfy the long-term objective function, you know, given the prediction that are, that are, that are, that are done. Now, we have to build those things in. We, if we want to build an autonomous AI system, we can uh, either have a very, very simple objective function, like drive your car, okay, and then you know, encode what that means, you know, don't drive too much above the speed limit, you know, um, you know if, uh, if a soccer ball crosses the street, there's probably a child running after it, you know, slow down, things like this. You know, you can build a lot of those kind of basic, uh, uh, basic rules into it. Um, but there's going to be probably going to be some sort of overarching uh, objective function as well. Now, if you want to build completely autonomous, generally intelligent machines, those objective functions will have to be aligned with human values, uh, if only because we need to interact with those machines uh, in a way. And you know, the same way, it's very annoying to interact. What if they with decide they don't want to interact with us? I mean, no, they can't decide. If we build this into them, you know, the same way we can decide not to be uh, hungry. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's just hardwired. But if this, so it, as you were saying, foom, part of what you, know, you describe in your book is that it's going to happen so quickly that because of the rapidity. <laughs> Excellent. So first, Max, say it is, and then you say it's not, OK? <laughs> um, so it's, the idea is that it happens so quickly, it's so exponentially fast that you know, first it, it goes from this narrow intelligence of winning go to a more generalized intelligence of the human level, and then what, like 90 minutes later, it's completely exceeded us a thousandfold. So first, I have to disappoint you here. <laughs> I'm not going to just say, yes, it's going to happen quickly. <laughs> what I did in the book was uh, I wanted to describe the full scenario of, of the, the possibilities that people talk about. One of them is that it happens very, very slowly. One of them is it happens very, very quickly, and there's a spectrum in between. Uh, the hard part, I think, is or, or I think the interesting part isn't to try to place bets on exactly what's most likely, but to ask what useful stuff can we do right now to maximize the chances that this is going to go well. And I think Jan summarized very nicely the different parts of the challenge, the aligning values of machines with ours. You have to make machines understand our goals, adopt our goals, retain our goals as they get smarter, and then also whose goals anyway. And, and each of those questions are actually really hard. The, the first one, for example, just to get machines to understand our goals. Suppose you, take, you tell, tell your New York Uber driver to take you to JFK as fast as possible, and you get there covered in vomit and chased by helicopters, and you're like, no, 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 that's not what I meant. And, he, and she says, that is exactly what you asked for. Um, then you've understood how hard it is to explain your goals to a machine that doesn't have the shared reference frame that other people have, right? And then to understand how hard it is to get other intelligent beings to actually not just understand, but adopt your goals. Well, to see how hard that is, raise your hand if you have kids. <laughs> well, you already know <laughs> how hard it is to get intelligent beings to adopt your goals, even if they know perfectly well what you want them to do, right? And, and then finally, the retaining goals part, you know, like, my kids were really psyched about Legos when they were kids and, and when they were little, and now uh, Legos aren't so cool anymore. 
they got smarter and their goals evolved. That some, that, so if we program these friendly AI machines that are so excited about taking care of us humans, we don't want to become like their Legos when they're much smarter that they're going kind of bored with, right? Each of these are, are actually fascinating technical challenges. I'm optimistic that we can solve them, but it's hard. We should get our, a lot of talented people working on it. It might take 30 years to figure it out. So I say, let's start that research now, you know, not the night before some folks on Red Bull decide to switch on their <laughs> super intelligence. Okay, so, so here's where you should not panic just now, okay? First of all, as I said before, we're very, very, very far from having figuring out the underlying principle to build really, truly intelligent machines, particularly autonomous, truly intelligent machines, the ones that can build models of the world, etc. Even the intelligence of a hamster, uh, at least the motor control intelligence of a hamster. So this is not something we need to worry about now because we have no idea how that's going to look like. So it's sort of like, you know, uh, we haven't invented the automobile yet, but we're worried about how to design uh, safety belts or brakes. Like, this is not a major technical okay. issue. So, um, so that's the, the first point, okay. And, and I've been, you know, criticized for saying, oh, you know, Jan says we don't need to worry about it because, you know, it's not gonna happen for the next 30 years, therefore blah, blah, blah. But I think it's because we have no idea how it's gonna look like, so trying to prevent something from going bad without knowing what it is, I think is, uh, you know, is, is premature at, at uh, you know, at, at least. Now, the second thing is, uh, you know, everything looks expo like exponential growth. And so the people who say, you know, the uh, you know, proponents of the singularity or transhumanism says, uh, you know, the intelligence of machine is on an exponential curve and when it passes human intelligence, then it will, you know, uh, conceive machines that are more intelligent than itself and then the exponential will continue. There's nothing that looks more li like an exponential than, than the beginning of a sigmoid. And everything in this universe has a limitation. Um, so, a machine cannot be become, you know, infinitely intelligent just because, you know, there's not infinite power on that it will have access to. Uh, the technology is limited, and so it limits, you know, the, the reason why we're not smarter than we are is because our head is limited because we have to go through the birth canal. Uh, and also because we can't afford to spend more than 25 watts uh, to, uh, to keep our, our brains uh, running. Uh, you know, it, it's very expensive. Uh, so, I mean, there's a number of limits like this that also apply to computers and intelligent computers. There's a lot of limits that, that is such that the evolution, instead of being exponential, is going to, uh, you know, ev every time it's going to have some sort of inflection point. Um, so, those are sort of a number of uh, y uh, reasons for this. And then, I think the problem of aligning uh, the values of machines to human values is not that hard of a problem. It, it's not like we need to solve it now because we don't have any purpose of it right now, but I don't think it's hard well, of a technical I problem. I know Max is dying to jump in, but one of um, uh, my concerns is that even if you do initiate an artificial intelligence by aligning your values with theirs, but you've also given it the capacity to learn in such a way that it, it, it can decrease the importance of certain ideas and boost the importance of others, how do you know it won't opt to unlearn it? Um, but I want to give Max a chance to, to reply. So yeah, I just so Jan there. mentioned three real, made three really uh, interesting points there. The first was this point about, well, if it's 30 years away, we don't need to worry now. The second point was about what looks like an exponential might be a sigmoid that's about to plateau. And, and, the <coughs> and then the, th the third one? Third one is, it's it's okay, start with one and two. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> one value alignment is easy. Oh yeah, value alignment is easy, exactly. <laughs> so for the first one, I'm very glad you brought up the example of the car. We, you know, we invented the car, we screwed up a bunch of times, and then we invented the seatbelt. And that was fine. And that's generally been fine in, in, the, in the past with technology. We've always tried to win this race between the growing power of the tech and the wisdom with which we manage the tech, right? And that strategy of learning from mistakes has served us very well. We invented fire, messed up a lot of times, then we invented the fire extinguisher and the fire exit, right? But as technology gets more powerful, which is the trend on this planet, right? At some point, it gets powerful to the point that we want to stop learning from mistakes. When you get to things like nuclear weapons, synthetic biology, superhuman AI, I would rather we don't learn from mistakes, <laughs> but rather plan ahead and get things right the first time, because it might be the only time we'll have. So, and then in terms of the second question part about the sigmoid here, you know, yeah, maybe it's gonna plateau, but I don't 
see any particular reason why it should plateau at human level in particular. There's nothing special about that. If, if, you're, if you don't have to go through your mommy's birth canal, which your laptop didn't, right, or your GPU cluster didn't, and if you look at, at the, you could make the same argument, it seems to me, to say that, well, our, all our attempts at airplane building in the 1800s and flying bats and stuff are going to plateau exactly at the level of birds. Well, they didn't. They our, did. Our airplanes go much faster than birds. Yeah, but they stopped Even pretty the much at, uh, you know, under Mach 1. Huh? <laughs> They pretty much plateau under Mach 1. We have fighter planes that go at Mach 3, and we've also gone to the moon, But they right? also plateau so at Mach 3. <laughs> anyway, and, and, <laughs> and then for the third point about, about value alignment, I <coughs> that it's so easy, I'm not so convinced that it's, that it's going to be easy, and I'd much rather play it safe. In case it's so hard it'll take 30 years, then, well, might as well start now. And as, as a bonus, you know, even if you're just concerned about short-term things, working a lot on value alignment today I think is going to be helpful even tomorrow. Uh, look mm -hmm. how incredibly stupid our machines are now and how many dumb things they do just because they're not value lined at all. Like we are in New York here, right? Where is it, is it, why did people build airplanes that actually had computers on them that weren't, didn't at least have the computer know that it should under no circumstance fly into buildings so that if the pilot tells it to do so, it just goes into some kind of safe mode and lands at the nearest airport, right? That's technology we already have. I call it the kindergarten ethics. It's the sort, of sort of ethics that pretty much everybody agrees on. Uh, we can start value lining our machines a little bit like this and we'll get rid of a lot of horrible things. And then hopefully we'll learn some things from that that we can build on to even value align more intelligent machines. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question back to you, Max, then, is how do you, you're, you know, you can invent the seatbelt and the car doesn't opt to remove them because it decides it really doesn't care about the seatbelt anymore that you cared about implementing. But if you're talking about a genuine intelligence, it can deviate from what we try to embed in its mind and it can opt to undo any value alignment we try to instill. Not any more than we can un un Are you sure? <laughs> undo our human nature. I mean, you, you, you just can't. But, but we can't change out our hardware the way, presumably we've been talking about these machines as this kind of a thing, but ultimately they're going to be able to change out, swap out their hardware pretty easily, maybe even be based in nanotech, have a more cellular kind of composition. They might be able to change So as things. humans, we have a way of hacking or objective function, if you want, mm -hmm. and that's drugs, mm -hmm. <laughs> all right? It's generally not entirely positive, <laughs> uh, you know, in the long term. Mm -hmm. And uh, so perhaps, you know, our, our- You think AI is gonna be hooked on drugs? Super AIs would be junkies, yeah. Yeah, they're gonna be junkies? You know? Yeah, I mean, they'll, you know, reprogram Digital their- junkies. Yeah. Your pleasure center to just, you know, have it activate all exactly. the time. Exactly. Maybe they're not going to care about this reality. Right. So this Maybe they're only going to be sitting there in this other reality of their own minds. In which case, we have nothing to worry about. But, <laughs> you know, but the more likely, w w the way we build them is, is in such a way that they cannot hack their objective function. Mm -hmm. uh, or at least not the basic, you know, this is, this connects with, you know, kind of famous science fiction mm -hmm. uh, concepts like the three laws, three laws of robotics by uh, mm -hmm. Isaac Asimov. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and, you know, the, the kind of rules we're building to machines are not of this type because mm -hmm. that turns out to be very di difficult, but, um, um, but there'll be things like this that the machines well will, will not be able to, uh, to modify. I, I'm, I'm sensitive to the fact that I want to open it up for questions, but you, you pointed to something about hacking our hardware, which I think is really interesting because while we're struggling to make silicon and metal intelligent, we've made tremendous progress in terms of hacking our own DNA. And it is now completely conceivable that, w that actually the next leap in intelligence will be by genetically reprogramming uh, originally human DNA sequence. And that that will happen before artificial intelligence happens in silicon and metal. I have a hard time believing that. That's really, really hard. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, there is- CRISPR is amazing. Yeah, but there's, there's obviously- I turned a yeast pink. <laughs> <laughs> with uh, something that was bought in the mail, a CRISPR well, kit. Well, there can be some, you know, minor <laughs> improvements to certain dimensions <laughs> that uh, we can bring to human intelligence, but they probably will not be universally uh, useful. That you know, we'll probably have to pay for it in other ways. I mean, that's the, that's you know one of the reasons why people have sort of different, um, um, you know, um, 
moods and, and personalities is because you want diversity in a population. You don't want to reprogram everybody to have the same personality because you know, that's bad for the survival of the species, that's far bad for you know, inventing new things, etc. Mm -hmm. You want people to specialize, mm -hmm. uh, to be complementary with each other. That's, mm -hmm. that's why we are social animals. Now, could we reprogram humans to be non-social animals like orangutans? No, that would be kind of weird. Yeah. <laughs> Max, what do you think about not just hacking our DNA to become our own successors in, in intelligence, but other kinds of artificial intelligence, not just a singular model, but the competition of different kinds? So I, I agree with one thing that Jan said, and I disagree with the other. Mm -hmm. So the boring part first, the agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, I agree with, with you that uh, human brain emulation or, or the biological route is not going to be the fastest path to superhuman intelligence any more than taking doing CRISPR on birds so they can evolve propellers was going to be the fastest way to the airplane, right? It's just easier ways to do it, and I think we'll get there first. Where, where I disagree is um, about this question, where, where this suggestion that value alignment isn't so hard, after all, <coughs> by making them in a nice analogy made with a human body. You know, first of all, of course, we humans tr try to override what our DNA wants a lot. Like our DNA wanted to make us to make copies of it, so it gave us sex drive. And we've figured out what the DNA is up to. We can't get rid of the sex drive, we don't want to, but we do bir use birth control. So take that genes, you know. <laughs> they, we get what we want, the DNA doesn't get what it wants. Uh, but, but John is right, you cannot do anything to take away your desire to eat. Um, but that's because you're biological, right? If you were a robot right now, and you were very smart and realized that you want to eat because of this uh, value chip that's sitting here, right? And you could just email somebody uh, with all the money you've <laughs> made, high frequency trading, and tell <laughs> them to come and swap that out for you. <laughs> if you're, even if your computer is stuck in a room with, with no robot arms, right? <laughs> they could replace that piece of hardware. I think ultimately, rather than trying to force machines to do things they don't want, a better strategy is what we try to do as parents and, and make them not even want to override the values. You know, and and uh, <coughs> that's, that seems also like something which, would, if the machines are conscious, they would be happier about too. Uh. Um, I, I, I think on that note, um, I could ask you guys questions all night, but it's a little bit unfair. So can we thank our speakers and then open it up for question and answer? <laughs> I'm hoping we have microphones running around, but um, I, I can repeat your question. If yes, here, yes. So the question was, what assumptions do AI researchers or AI tools make about their yeah. communities? Yeah. So what assumptions do AI research tools make about their communities? Communities? You mean human com human communities? Yeah, the communities of researchers in AI. Um, you mean the, do they follow the a certain ethics? Is that what you mean? Okay, the tools have nothing to do with human communities. Uh, they're basically m mathematical engines. Um, you know, I don't know if a matrix matrix product has any kind of bias, but I don't think so. I mean, it's just a mathematical operation, and so the tools in themselves don't don't have any bias. On the other hand, the data that people use to train machines sometimes can be very biased. And some people are using machine learning tools, not necessarily deep learning or AI, but just basic machine learning tools to make decisions about people, do it in a very stupid way, and in ways that reflect the biases in the data and basically just propagate the existing biases in society. So the bias is in the data, and the bias is in uh, you know, the relative incompetence of some of the people who use this. It's not necessarily that they are uh, you know, they have nefarious intent, but they just don't pay attention. Um, front, Maria, you have a question? Mike? And then Jerry, but then I can't just favor the front row, so somebody in the back has to stand up for me to see them if they have a question. Okay, hand there, so you'll be third. So when Darwin was writing on the origin of species, he wrote in the marginalia of one of the books he was reading, never say higher or lower, say more complex. And that was one of the first um, proposals that certain properties of organisms like intelligence are emergent properties and not just a linear progression. Uh, and Jan, I want to push back on your definition of intelligence as the ability to predict the future from the past, because the question 
is not really what kind of world we can have, it's what kind of world we should have, which has a moral dimension. And is it possible that moral dimension, which is different from value alignment, because we had values 150 years ago that we find morally repugnant today, like slavery, and values that we have today that they found morally repugnant then, like polyamory and things like that. Could morality be an emergent property of AI? And if so, how do we plan for it and how do we control for it and how do we address it? So I think that's a fantastic question. I think it's a question more for, uh, frankly, to, for, for a philosopher than a computer scientist like me, but I'll try to kind of give you my, my opinion, which you have to take with a grain of salt. So I think, in fact, this ability to predict is essential to the phenomenon that you described. So things that we considered moral at some, ti at some time in the past that we now consider immoral is because we've realized they're bad in the long run. And it's because now we have better models of how societies evolve, and we realize that there are major uh, impediments uh, you know, major kind of bad consequences, if you want, to things that we, we considered immoral in the past, but in fact, uh, in fact aren't, or, or, or vice versa, for that matter. You know, we considered, you know, still in the U.S., we, uh, yeah, you know, it's considered okay for the state to kill people, right? Uh, either in the streets or, um, or, you know, because of the death penalty. You know, it's uh, not accepted in most other countries in the world. Uh, so... The, the, those notions of morality, I think, are, are direct consequences of a world model. And so here's, here's a more concrete example, right? We have a reptilian brain that uh, basically does not care too much about prediction. It basically just satisfies our basic instinct. So if you are in front, I don't know if you like chocolate cake, but let's assume you do, okay? Uh, you're just in, fr you know, you put a nice piece of you know, juicy chocolate cake just in front of you. And your reptilian brain says, go for it, it's calories. And I'm by the way, stealing this example from uh, Gary Marcus, who we were mentioning earlier. Um, your frontal cortex, which is where your long-term prediction engine resides, says, wait a minute, um, you know, this might be satisfying in the short term, but in the long run, it may not be so good for you. Uh, and so there are things like this where, depending on how much you trade uh, short-term certainty for long-term uh, reward, you all make different choices. And I think a lot of the moral choices we make have to do with uh, different uh, uh, trade-offs between short-term and long-term, uh, different uncertainty we attribute to long-term results. And so if you have a, l a huge uncertainty on long-term results, uh, y you know, you're not gonna satisfy a long-term uh, uh, criterion. You're gonna make a decision that satisfies the short-term because you don't know what's gonna happen in the long-term. Uh, so as our models of the world are refined, I think we make more and more all decisions. Uh, ultimately, it's the same loss function. It's unclear that we're going to be able to give an artificial intelligence a proper world simulator. Max? Yeah. I was just very happy that you asked this question about morality also, <coughs> because I, I feel that um, once a technology gets powerful enough that it starts to impact the world, it's very important that those of us who are tech nerds who like to build cool things also start to think about the implications and things like morality. For example, physicists these days don't just think about how cool it is to build nuclear bombs because they go boom, but also have gone very engaged in moral issues about their trying to limit the risk of, of accidental nuclear war, right? And, and in the same sense, I'm very happy that the AI community has really come together and, and engaged in this discussion now. Uh, for example, both Jan and I were at this conference in the Silmar, California back in January where there was a lot of discussion of these things and there were 23 Asilomar AI principles that a lot of people, including Jan and me, signed on to. And the very last one on the list goes right to your question, actually. It says that if superintelligence is ever developed, it should be for the benefit of all humanity <coughs> in support of widely shared goals and, and values. And, and so this is a moral statement now that the researchers are saying, right? Now, what should those values be? That's obviously not something that should be left just to Jan and me and, and a bunch of, of, of their professors. It's all of our future. So I think it's also great that you, Jana, are doing a debate like this. To, this is a discussion, like, this is a conversation that everybody has to be part of. What kind of future do we really want to create from a moral perspective? If we don't know what we want, 
probably not going to get it. It might be an interesting question. Also, part of Maria's question is, will it inevitably emerge? Is it something that emerges almost inevitably in the same kind of way that we asked about consciousness? Um, Jerry, you, you had a question, Mike? Can we also get a mic to the further regions over there so people can ask? Someone's got one back there? OK. Uh, so thank you. Perhaps underlying the last discussion is the question of free will. Would you comment on your views, the extent to which it is true or an illusion? And as far as machines go, if a machine were to achieve self-awareness and the machine believed that it was exercising free will, would it necessarily be a victim of an illusion just as we might be or perhaps not so? Yeah, I think so. I think uh, their illusion of free will would probably be very similar to ours, yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah. Well, I, 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 I say illusion because, you know, the physicists tell us, you know, that macrophysics is all deterministic anyway, so, you know, the... Yeah, I, I agree with Jan. I, I think any other intelligent entity we ever build is also going to feel that it has free will. And whenever I see two people arguing about free will, <laughs> it always turns out that they've defined what they mean by this in different ways. The, there's a question in the back. Whoever has the mic? Who's got the mic? Somebody give somebody a mic. I have a mic. Oh, good. Um, yeah, and at the beginning of your talk, you mentioned that we have a general model of computation, and the question is, how does, how, how does computation take place in the mind? Um, but at the same time, uh, researchers have shown that things like emotions can be felt in the stomach, and there's the notion of embodiment, um, and that cognition is embodied, and that we can't really separate the mind from the body. So is it a matter of having a a Turing machine that is you know, infinite in storage and speed, or like a von Neumann computer that is infinite and we can, we can build a, a human intelligence there, or do we need to really, or will we ultimately need to think about computation itself in a, in a new way to achieve a human intelligence? Yeah, that's, that's a in very interesting question. Uh, you know, the mind-body problem and et cetera. Can, can we build a machine that has uh, some semblance of human-like intelligence without having a body? Probably not. Or at least not. I mean, it will have some sort. Of, it will have to have some sort of either physical or simulated body, but to kind of ex have an experience that's somewhat similar to to uh, to human, it will have to have a body, um, or, or some way of you know acting on the world. If if its body or or its way of acting on the world is very different from ours, then its experience would be very different. The nature of its intelligence would be very very different. Um, but we we might still have you know super intelligent machines that are generally intelligent that don't have a body. I think that's very possible. I would add to that. I think that when you feel something in your stomach, that, um, that subjective experience is actually happening in your head, not in your stomach. And we know that because there are some people who feel a terrible pain in their hand, even though their hand was amputated 10 years ago. It's called phantom pain, right? And all of you have actually experienced something a little bit like that, where you experience your feet moving and you're running even though they're not, because you're having a dream. So I, I agree with Jan that <coughs> in principle, even something which is very disembodied could experience these sort of things. Can we get a mic to a gentleman standing over by the bar? Over by the bar? Let's just keep those mics moving. If Hi. you have a mic, just keep passing it around to the audience. Uh, this question is for Max. Um, what were your thoughts on constructor theory coming out of like Oxford, um, the ideas of uh, things can, you know, transformations. Do you think that's going to be helpful in, in uh, melding like quantum mechanics and, and general relativity? Do you think constructive theory is like a viable theory in all and even in computer science? So as much as I would love to answer physics questions because <laughs> they keep me awake at night, I think uh, we should probably talk about that afterwards during okay. the drinks so that Jana doesn't uh, get upset with me. I don't mind answering questions about general relativity. Give, give, him a one, give him a one sentence answer. Two. You've got 40 characters, 140 characters. The theory of everything is U equals zero. <laughs> I'll tell okay, you you're getting, you're U getting that answer three. at the book signing table. Do we All have right. a, Thank you. Do we have another I, mic? Yeah. yeah. Um, so uh, I wanted to go back to the point about uh, enhancing ourselves. Um, you know, we're already very intelligent, and I'm wondering why. Um, we're obsessed with making a machine like us instead of enhancing our own abilities um, because I can see a future where we rely on this technology as a crutch 
and instead of us being smart, like we say we're so smart today, but we're really relying on our phone to take us somewhere or to drive or whatever, what have you. Well, that's kind of the essence of technology, right? All of technology is a crutch that we, we have a hard time getting rid of once we, we experienced it, right? We, now we have a smartphone, but you know, you know, we have our cars and everything. So uh, I think a lot of what people are working on in the end is en enhancing and amplifying human intelligence, not necessarily just building autonomous intelligence systems that are you know, aside from, uh, from, from, from humans. I think the vast majority of AI systems will be built to, to enhance and amplify human intelligence. So there is this relationship I was mentioning before, the idea of the, you know, the reptilian brain and the neocortex, and the neocortex you know, sometimes uh, you know, sort of amplifies the intelligence of the, of the reptilian brain, but the, the reptilian brain is the one that kind of drives the, the, the sort of basic uh, uh, drives. Uh, so I think you know, maybe AI systems will be sort of like an exocortex kind of thing that uh, we can use to make better prediction, better choices, etc. but ultimately are subservient to our cortex, which itself is subservient to a reptilian brain. So does it, isn't Elon Musk working on a neural implant? He, he has a, a bunch company. of people. There is, there's a project at Facebook also. Yeah. I mean, there's yeah. a number of different projects on it this. But, yeah. it, but no matter how far technology gets, I think you all have a personal choice. Do you want to own your technology, or do you want your technology to own you? Uh, who do you want to be? Do you want to be the person who can amplify your intelligence with technology and accomplish more awesome things? Or do you want to be the person who interrupts every single conversation you ever have with somebody by looking at your smartphone? You, know, you should think that through and then and, and make that decision very deliberately. You have a mic back there? Yeah. So oh, sorry, there's two mics. Oh, oh, oh. go ahead. Um, all right. So so far, like the discussion of the night that we had so far, mostly touched upon as like general purpose artificial super intelligence. But like I work in like I work and in found internet startups, and we implement AI, so-called AI, in our apps. And I do find the discussion a little jarring, <laughs> because like we had the metaphor so far, right? We talk about artificial intelligence as if like their babies or hamster or like the slide at the back is kind of misleading because like as if like artificial intelligence is something that is still we can contain as if it's an object by itself, but it's not, right? Like all these apps out there is already using like rather dumb, but it's still artificial intelligence. And we already give it a lot of influence and power to affect how the world works, right? Facebook for its AI and their algorithms, it might have uh, affected like the election and all these things. Uber, if you see it as like an artificial intelligence, is like is already like controlling where all the drivers should go and where they should pick up people. And in five years, like talking about Bloomsday, it will be like these artificial intelligence, like if they cannot solve the tro trolley problem, they might just ask all the automated cars to just stop or crash into people because that's the dumb artificial intelligence thing is the way to solve the trolley problem. So what do you think about the fact that like dumb artificial intelligence, like not the super artificial intelligence is already influencing the world today, which may train the super intelligence in the future. Yeah, do you think it's happening and without our control? Do yeah. you think it's already happening? Like without us controlling it? Well, I mean, some people control it, certainly. Uh, if they don't, it's by, it's not because the system are, you know, taking over or becoming uncontrollable, but because of usual, you know, run of the mill garden variety mistakes. Um, so it's true that the, as, as I said before, uh, the systems that we have currently are systems that train using supervised learning, a few with reinforcement learning. You know, we call them AI, they're not, real AI in the sense that, you know, again, they don't have the level of intelligence of a rat. Um, so, you know, it, 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 we, have to know, we have to know what we're talking about. They're, they're capable of amazing feats, which generally are very specialized, uh, just what they've been trained to do. Uh, now, those are very useful in society. You know, uh, sure, the Uber system might, uh, I mean, the same way your GPS determines which route you take to go from point A to point B, and you follow it. Uh, because it knows about traffic and stuff like that, so does it run your life? No. Um, 
So yeah, the Uber systems decide you know which uh, driver we should go where and all that stuff. Um, you know, people don't have to subject to that. Um, that's that's a way of, you know, it's like you know, economic efficiency maximization, nothing else. Max, do you think the internet is already thinking that it's already happening? <laughs> <laughs> it, do, I, do I think it's intelligent? Well, as I said, people usually quibble about this because they have different definitions of intelligence. Of course, the, in the internet can do certain tasks, but does it have artificial general intelligence? No. Let's get, uh, try to get uh, one more question over here. I don't know where the mics are, but just keep them roving. We'll try to get two more questions. Yeah. Hey, uh, so I think a lot of people have concerns about super intelligence, but I'm personally more concerned with adversarial AI uh, that manipulates the AIs that our technology becomes dependent upon in the future. Could you say a few words about the uh, vulnerability of current AIs to adversarial systems and where you see that field going? Yeah, so th yeah, I mean, there's, there's been quite a bit of, of work over the last year or two on you know, how easy is it to fool an image recognition system into thinking that uh, you know, a, a street sign of, or road sign of some kind is, is something else, or you know, not seeing it or ignoring it, in thinking that you know, a school bus is a giraffe or whatever. And it, it seems that the systems we currently have uh, developed for computer vision, uh, com convolutional nets, kind of a bit of my invention from way back, um, are vulnerable to minor changes in an image that to a human eye doesn't change the nature of the image, but to the, this neural net uh, will make it interpret the image in completely different ways. So there is still a lot of debate about really how vulnerable those systems will be in real life. Uh, and it's, you know, it's still kind of a topic of research. It's also a topic of research on how you fix this if you think it's really a problem. So far, people didn't think that was a problem, so there was no attempt to fix it. Now that it's identified as possibly a problem, there are people who are starting to think about possibly how to fix it. Uh, that are based essentially on uh, unsupervised learning reconstruction and adversarial training, which is another example that, that we mentioned before. So there's various techniques that are being explored. Um, you know, it's not today like something to really worry about very much. Yeah. In my whoever, opinion. whoever has a mic gets to ask the Hello. last question. Yes. Hey. So my question is really about what you kind of mentioned a couple of times, which is there are different definitions for intelligence. And I feel like when we've been talking about it tonight, a lot of what we're hearing is based in how we think about performance and tasks, right? So how well you can compute, um, how fast can you complete certain tasks. And that also kind of reminds me not to get political, but it's very patriarchal. Like, how far you can you reach? And I feel like there isn't necessarily this question being asked about, well, what actually is intelligence and what are we looking for? Like, where are the edges of those conversations among scientists? Because I know they're out there, and we've talked about it a little bit with consciousness, but I think it's really important, because otherwise we're just talking about nothing, kind of. <laughs> yeah, I, th I, think, I think there's quite a lot of things in the public discourse that actually r reveal, uh, you know, call it patriarchal, patriarchal, perhaps, or maybe another name of the, s the same type, but uh, for example, the idea that somehow that super intelligence will necessarily want to take over the world. Uh, I think at least in my experience, it is not the case that the will to take over the world is correlated with intelligence. It's actually correlated with testosterone. <laughs> so, I know robots, super intelligent robots, won't have testosterone. <laughs> yeah, um, let's not program that in there. And, <laughs> and so, uh, y you know, we have good examples of people who actually want power who are not particularly intelligent, you know, very prominent examples today. Um, and, and so, y you know, there are examples like this, um, you know, beyond this, like how do you define intelligence and what are the various dimensions on which you measure it and whether it's a task. You know, as scientists, when we want to make progress, we have to have a task by which we measure success or progress. And so we have to define a task and say, like, do we make progress on this task? And now, you know, the task like uh, language translation, image recognition, object classification, you know, things like this are, are well established. And then others, not so well, that we don't, we don't even know how to measure performance. 
uh, like, you know, summarization of text, like, or like, you know, we want to build, like, one of the things that a lot of people are working on at the moment in AI research is dialogue systems. So systems that you can talk to and are not frustrating to talk to, they have some amount of background knowledge that make, it, make them kind of, you know, pleasant to talk to and they actually are useful. <laughs> uh, it's very hard. We don't even know how to measure how well they work mm. um, because they have to interact with people for that. Yeah. So it's um, getting really restless at the book signing table, so we're going to release them, and I'm going to give Max a chance to close. But just to remind you, after this, we're going to bring our guests to the book signing table, where you can also get limited edition Psycon patches. <laughs> and, um, and on that note, I want to let Max have a chance to respond to that. Great. I'm so glad that you asked in your very last question, uh, wh where do you want to go? Because um, <coughs> I think this is an incredibly important question for us to ask as humanity is. You know, I ask that question all the time when students walk into my office to ask for career advice. Where do you want to go? Where do you want to be in 10 years? And like, if she says, well, maybe I'll be in a cancer ward, maybe I'll have gotten hit by a bus, I'll get really upset with her. I'll tell her, look, that's no way to do career planning. I want her to come in with fire in her eyes and say, this is my dream, that's where I want to go. Then we can talk about challenges and how to overcome them. But my wife, who's sitting here tonight, Maya, she likes to point out that this parody example of how we should not go about our own personal life planning is exactly what we're doing as a species. How do we envision the future in the movies? It's always some sort of apocalypse, dystopia, right? In books, same thing. I think we should all really ask the question that you're asking here. What kind of future is it that we all want to create and try to envision positive places where we really want to go and then figure out how to get there. I think that's a perfect note to end on. Let's thank our speakers again.